Welcome. I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, we're going to wrap up our series here on the Old Testament, just looking at the Old Testament law and trying to understand it in its historical context. And then we're going to jump back over to uh, discussing the theological systems and how they interpret the Old Testament and understand things like Hebraic roots and uh, covenant theology, dispensationalism, and the truth, which is to understand the mystery of Christ better. And But first, let's go ahead and wrap up what we were doing in the Old Testament. Now, in the last video, I, I dropped the bomb and said this. We are not under the Old Covenant, including the Ten Commandments. Now, when we, we say such a thing, then we start to think, well, so then we can lie and, uh, you know, we can lie and murder and commit adultery. Of course, the answer is no. The Bible is very clear about that. So let's go ahead and look at how this works. How is it that we are not under the law, including the Old Covenant, uh, and including the Ten Commandments, but we are still to live righteous lives. Because this is something that the uh, so-called free grace movement really does not understand. They say, since we're not under law, and the Bible's clear that we're not, then that means that we're lawless people. We are not a lawless people, my friend. Okay, Second Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 4. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So the old covenant was uh, of the letter. When the scripture and Paul particularly, I think of uh, Romans chapter 2, when he talks about not being by the letter, but by the spirit, this is the new covenant, the spirit of God. Jeremiah 31 says that the spirit of God will come to dwell in us, write the law of God on our hearts, and that each one of us would know the Lord. So the new covenant is not is the spirit the old covenant is the letter it jo goes on in verse 7 and 8 but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stone so this letter letter of the law this old testament this old covenant we looked at it before in deuteronomy chapter 4 and 5 the old covenant is the 10 commandments it also includes the rest of the teaching that came from god the law of god that was through moses but it also includes the 10 commandments written and engraved in stones was glorious so that the children of israel could not look steadily at the face of moses because of the glory of his countenance which glory was passing away how will the ministry how will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious so the new covenant, in the new covenant, we are not under the Old Testament law, including though the laws that were written and engraved on stone, the Ten Commandments. So uh, how are we to understand? Oh, it goes on here. Uh, verse 9. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was gl made glorious had no glory in this respect because the, of the glory that excels. For what is passing away was glorious what remains is much glorious, more glorious. The old covenant has passed away. We are under the new covenant. Again, this doesn't mean we are lawless. We do have a law. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 through 15. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ, or the old covenant, because the veil is taken away in Christ, but even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. So when people read the old covenant in, uh, in the first five books of the law of Moses, when they read that old covenant, they do not understand until they turn to Christ. So again, we're back where we started in talking about the theological systems, that the only way we understand the Old Testament is not only in its historic context, which is what we're going through now, but also through apostolic revelation that was given to the apostles in Luke chapter 24, also Ephesians chapter 3, Paul talks about it. And here, this is what he's speaking about, that by the Spirit, he's able to communicate the things of the new covenant so that we can understand the prophetic meaning of the Old Testament. So, uh, verse 16, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image of glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, in the new covenant, when we're made new crea creations in Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit, then when we read the old covenant scriptures, we're able to understand not only their historical context, but what they say to us. This is the important matter. Because as I've mentioned a few times, when I first became a Christian, I did not know how to deal with the Old Testament. I didn't know how to interpret it. I definitely didn't know how to apply it. And so we want to be able to use all of the scriptures because all of it's inspired by God and profitable for training in righteousness and truth. Uh, 
So we need to use the whole scripture, not just the New Testament. The New Testament is our lens by which we read the Old Testament, which has a prophetic meaning. Now let's go ahead and jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through 21. Because whenever we learn, okay, I'm not under the law of Moses, well then what am I under? Verse 19 starts this way. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. This is Paul talking about his evangelistic strategy. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. So when he was ministering among the Jews, chapter 9 and chapter 10 tell us that he would eat uh, only kosher food among the Jews. Verse 21, to those who are without law, the Gentiles, as without law. So he's saying, but when I'm with the Gentiles, I don't obey those laws of Moses. And he says, but not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. So it's very important for us to understand that in the new covenant, as Christians, we are not without law. We are not a lawless people. This is why Jesus said on, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, that those that are going to be cast away from him, that he's going to disown on that day, are those that walk in iniquity, in lawlessness, that practice lawlessness. If you practice lawlessness, you will perish. We must, by the Spirit of God, walk according to God's holy law, the law of Jesus Christ. Uh, if we here I want to ask the question, okay, how is it that we are not under the law of Moses, including the Ten Commandments? How can this be? I mean, did God just change his mind? You know, if people that are in the Hebraic Roots Movement or some other groups will say, well, God can't just change his mind and change the law. We see in Hebrews chapter 9 that God does change the law whenever there's a change of priesthood. But we also have to ask the question, well, he can't just like, okay, no, never mind. You know, the Jews don't have to keep the law of Moses. It was, uh, never mind about that. You know, so how is it that we are no longer under the law of Moses. Now, this is what Paul teaches in all of his letters everywhere. But a lot of times we don't understand because we don't really follow along with his thinking because we don't understand that he's arguing not with the Papists. He's not arguing with the papacy, which is the way the, the Martin Luther and you know Calvin, when they would read Paul's letters, they would think of it only in the terminology of their day. And so they would think of fighting against, uh, you know, you know, earning salvation by works according to the, the, the system of Roman Catholicism. But what Paul was dealing with was he was dealing with the Judaizers, those that were saying that you had to keep the law of Moses, you had to be circumcised in order to be part of God's covenant people and in right standing with God. So how is it that he argued that we are no, under, no longer under the law of Moses, even for the Jews that are in Christ, they are no longer under the law of Moses? He explains it well in Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 1. He says, or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who, who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no longer an adulteress, though she marries another man. So what's Paul's argument here? He's saying, look, the law of Moses was this earthly covenant given with these commands. It was for this life. It wasn't for the next life. It was for this life. So when a woman is married to a man and she leaves her husband and marries somebody else, she would be an adulteress. But if her husband dies, the law of Moses no longer has effect in his life or in her life. Death ends the authority of the law of Moses because it's only for this world. It's only in this life. So that's his point. But he goes on. In verse 4, he, he says this, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So here's what he's saying. When we were baptized into Christ, when we were joined to Jesus Christ through faith in him, then what happens is we die with him and we're raised with him. So Jesus, think of it this way. When Jesus died, you know, on this earth, he, he lived in obedience to the law of Moses. Even though he was the son of God, he submitted that for our sake. But whenever he died, was he still under the law of Moses? Of course not, because the law of Moses only has effect while somebody's alive. So now Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, is no longer under the law of Moses. He is purely living to the Father. As a man, he is living unto God the Father. So what does that have to do with us? When we trust in Christ, we die with him and we are raised with him. 
So we also are no longer under the law of Moses because we are dead. We died with Jesus Christ. We were crucified. And because we were crucified, we are dead people and dead people are not under the law of Moses. But we are not without law because when we were we died, we also rose up to have a newness of life. That means that we walk with God through Messiah. We submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and he is our law. Jesus Christ is the law of God. We obey him. We follow him by the power of the Holy Spirit. We follow him in the principle of loving God and loving our neighbor. By doing that, we are walking in this new life. We're no longer under the law of Moses because we're in a new world. We're in a new creation. This is why uh, keeping the Sabbath day where we celebrate the old creation, it doesn't make any sense for a Christian. Because as a Christian, we've already gone into a new creation. All the old things have passed away and the new things have come. We are new creatures in Jesus Christ. Christ. There is a new world that we have entered. You know, whenever Noah came through the flood, all the old world was gone and there was a brand new world. In the same way, when we came out of our baptism, dead to the world, dead to sin, and dead to the law of Moses, including the Ten Commandments, then we're raised to a brand new life, a new creation, and now we submit to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, with his law in our mind and in our heart. This is how we're freed from the law of Moses, because we we died and the law of Moses only has power over somebody as long as they live. He goes on in Romans chapter 7 verse 5 through 6. Now if you've ever been confused by Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8 then this is a good passage for you to understand because Romans chapter 7 talks about this man and Paul puts it sometimes in the first person. He says I'm like bound to sin. I'm controlled by sin. There's nothing I can do. And then in Romans chapter 8, he's talking about now we walk in the righteousness of the law. Now we uh, are, are free from the bondage of sin. And, and we say, man, this is a big contrast. So are we supposed to live by Romans chapter 7 like we're just always sinful creatures that are, can never obey God? Or are we those that are free in Jesus Christ and we can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? So here is a summary of these two chapters. Romans chapter 7, verse 5. For when we were in the flesh... The sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Romans chapter 7, this is a summary. When we were in the flesh, that means we didn't have the spirit of God. The, the, the man in Romans chapter 7, Paul says, look, I want to obey the law of God. I see that the law of God is good, but when I try to do it, I can't because sin controls me. Sin is controlling me. This is somebody who is living under the law of Moses. They have the law engraved on stone. They have the law written out in the scrolls, the book of Moses. But they can't obey it because the law of God is not written in their heart. They don't have the spirit of God. They're not changed into a new creature. It's only something that can stem the tide. As we talked a few videos ago, it can stem the tide of corruption, but it can't change our character and our nature. And so for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused in the law were at work in the members to bear fruit to death. This is Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 8 is summarized here. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So you see here what happened. Because we died with Christ, now we're resurrected with Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the law of God written inside of us. He works in us to will and to act according to his good pleasure, and we work out that salvation that he's working in us, not by the letter. Not by the, those letters engraved in stone, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, trusting in him, following him, submitting to the Spirit of God, we walk in free, we bear fruit unto God, not unto death. That's Romans chapter 8, a summary of it. So, can we use the law of Moses? So this is, this is why we're free, okay? We're free because we died to, we've died to the law and now we're, we're resurrected with Christ and we're filled with the Spirit of God so that we can walk according to the law of God uh, just as it's always been God's will that we do. So, but the question is, in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, sometimes they will quote from the law of Moses, particularly the Ten Commandments, but elsewhere also. So how can we do this? So can we use the law? First of all, let's go to Romans chapter 13 and see where Paul does this. Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love God, one love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, he's going to quote the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not covet. And if there are any other commandments are summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love works no evil to your neighbor, their neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So, He's saying this, he can quote the Old Testament. Anything 
do not lie. Do not commit uh, 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 adultery. Don't commit sexual immorality. Don't uh, commit uh, homosexuality. Uh, don't commit witchcraft. All these things are going to be summed up in the commands, do, love, your, love God and love your neighbor. So those fulfill the law. So the law of Jesus Christ fulfill those, fulfills those things. So we can refer to the Old Testament law. Uh, this is where covenant theology is not so far off the mark. Even though they separate things into moral, civil, and ceremonial, that doesn't mean that they're completely off base. Because when we go back to the Old Testament law, we can quote the Old Testament law with force because the New Testament law, the love God and to love your neighbor, also sums up those things. If we go back to Sabbath day or we go back to offering sacrifices, that's not summed up in love God and love your neighbor. But when we go back to do not lie, do not steal, do not covet, these things are summed up in those commands. So we can quote those with authority as Paul does. But there's a fulfillment of the law and then there's the law. This is what we've got to get. There's the law, which was a type and a shadow. And then there's the fulfillment of the law, which is the law of Jesus Christ. What he spoke on the Sermon on the Mountain and other places, his commandments. That's why he says, go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. His commands are the rock that we build our house on. If we listen to his commands and obey them, we will build our house on a rock. If we listen to them and do not obey them, we will be destroyed on judgment day. Jesus Christ, his words are going to judge us on that day. So we need to understand that's the fulfillment of the law. So we can quote the Old Testament because it's a type and a shadow of this law that we live and walk under. Another place is James chapter 2. James chapter 2, starting in verse 8. If you fulfill the royal law according to scripture, the loyal law, the kingdom law, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted of the law as sinners. What law? What law is he talking about? For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of breaking the whole law. What's this whole law? For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not kill. Now if you do not commit adultery and yet you kill, you have become a lawbreaker. So it looks like he's talking about the Old Testament law, but we know that we're no longer under the Old Testament law. So how is it that he's quoting the Old Testament law and saying it's something we're under? Because he's quoting the type and he's saying this points to what we're actually under, the royal law of scripture. And so the whole law is fulfilled up in this. Notice that he doesn't quote and the apostles never quote. When they when they go to you know, Galatians chapter 5 or they quote a list of sins, they never include Sabbath. They never include eating unclean food. They never include any of those things. They always include the moral laws. This is why covenant theology is not so far off because they understand the nature of Christ's law. They understand that it is moral in nature, it's universal in nature, and it's eternal in nature. And so when we come here, here he's quoting and saying that we, if we are obeying on, disobeying on one point, we're disobeying and rebelling against God and his law. Verse, uh, let's see, so it's getting hard to read here. Okay, now if we do not commit adultery, yet you kill, you have become a lawbreaker. Verse 12, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. What is the law of liberty? It's the law of Jesus Christ. We're not under all the old ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. We're not under all those things. Now we're risen from the dead with Jesus Christ, filled with his spirit and able to walk in the knowledge of God, walking in his character by the power of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. For he who has shown no mercy will have, uh, will have judgment without mercy, for mercy triumphs over judgment. How does mercy triumph over judgment? Because in the same way you give, it will be given back to you. If you love others, show them mercy, compassion, forgiveness. God will be gracious to you. But if you don't walk in the royal law according to scripture, loving your neighbor as yourself and even your enemy, then you will be judged strictly according to this law, this, this law of liberty, this law of mercy. So we can quote the Old Testament scriptures, but we quote it and we quote the Old Testament law as a, uh, a type of the New Testament. Now, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 through 17. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or in regarding in festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So when we look to the Old Testament law, we need to understand how to interpret it. We interpret it through Jesus Christ. Christ. We don't interpret it through its only its context towards the nation of Israel because we are not the nation of Israel. We are the resurrected children of God in Jesus Christ. There's no Jew, Gentile, there's no uh, male or female, slave or free, but we are all one in Jesus Christ by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Now, um, we need to understand that the Old Testament law was a prophetic picture. 
uh, we can see this not only in the moral aspects of the law, but in other areas. For example, the temple was only a type and a shadow of the heavenly temple that we deal with, that we deal with coming into the true presence of God, not just coming into the Ark of the Covenant, but we come into the presence of God in heaven and through the sacrifice, not the sacrifice of bulls and, uh, and goats, but we come in through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we see the Old Testament was a shadow of the reality, which is a heaven, heavenly reality. Also, uh, we see that our Passover is not celebrating, celebra- celebrating being delivered from Egypt, but we were celebrated from slavery to sin and death. And so weekly when we come together in fellowship uh, over the Lord's Supper, what we are doing is celebrating our Passover, our deliverance from bondage to sin. Um, also, the temple in the Old Testament had the Spirit of God dwelling in it. Well, now we are the temple of God. So in the New Testament, we understand that, oh, we've been filled with the Spirit of God and we are the temple of God. Another aspect that we can look at it, even in church government, when we go to the Old Testament, we see, wow, Israel was a nation and it was ruled with certain laws. For example, if, you know, a rebellious son were to uh, curse his father or mother, then he should be taken and stoned. If he hit his father or mother, he'd be, he'd be stoned to death. Okay, do we do that in the New Covenant? No, we do not. So can we learn anything from that, that the adulterer is stoned in the Old Covenant? We can. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, he says, look, If somebody sins, a brother sins, you go to him and confront him. If he doesn't deal with it, take two or three witnesses. If not then, then you take before the whole church and you cast him out as a tax collector. You don't stone them to death, but there's the same principle. Two or three witnesses are gathered against him to say, look, this man's guilty, and he's separated from Israel, separated from the church. He's He's cast out and cut off from the people of God. We see this exemplified in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 when a man was sleeping with his mother-in-law. And so Paul says, now you need to hand this man over and he needs to be excommunicated. So he was excommunicated. But when we go over to 2 Corinthians, I believe in chapter 2, the man had already repented and he was brought back into fellowship with the church and they renewed and showed their love for him. So we see this principle comes from the Old Testament law, but it's fulfilled in the church. So the Old Testament law that was given to Israel, even the national and civil laws are, have their fulfillment in the body of Christ and how we lead one another. The Old Testament, they had elders that sat at the gate. In the New Testament, we have the elders in the body of Christ that they work together as under shepherds with the Lord to lead the body of Christ as the people, as a holy nation set apart from all the other nations. Both Jew and Gentile joined together in Jesus Christ, now set apart, and we don't have the same sort of uh, command that they were given to keep themselves separate separate from all the nations. No, we're given the great commission to go into all nations proclaiming the gospel because we are not corrupted by the world, but we go into the world with the power of deliverance by the power of the Holy Spirit and we bring the gospel that can set men free. And so God is bringing out an ecclesia. He's bringing out a called out ones from out throughout all the world through the gospel, through the church. So I just want us to give a picture. We're going to talk about this Uh, much more in the future, God willing, but I just want us to get a picture. We are not under the law of Moses, including the Ten Commandments. Why not? Because we died and dead people are not under the law anymore. But we are, in our life, risen with Jesus Christ. We are now filled with the Spirit of God so that we can walk according to God's law, the law of Jesus Christ that's written in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit that's summed up in the commands, love God and love your neighbor, that we walk together with the church. We can we can understand from the Old Testament the picture and the type, understanding what the fulfillment is in Jesus Christ, that he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the the law. And we see that in the believers. Sorry this has gone a little bit long, but I hope you've stuck with me and got something out of this. God bless.